Lord, let your face shine on me and I shall be saved. This is a refrain that comes up oftentimes in the Old Testament. The longing to see the face of God. And, and insofar as we experience the vision of God in His glory in heaven, there's something in that vision that is meant to save us. To save us from sins, to save us from evil, and to preserve us unto eternal life. And if you think about it, you know, even heaven itself is described as what? The beatific vision. Right? We're meant for an eternal beholding of God. And that's why you know, mystics say that one of the greatest and foretastes of heaven is actually falling in love. And just that the pure gaze that you would share with one another or with your child when they're younger is a foretaste of what heaven is supposed to be. And anyone who's experienced that knows that there's nothing that is a deeper experience of being known and loved and you're being shared with another than that. And the opposite of hell. Hell is the experience of the deprivation of God. To be forever separated from His gaze. And anyone who's ever been in love or had children, had them go away. You know it's a foretaste of a sorrow of losing that, that image that you once shared. And I think when the psalmist says this, that let your face shine on me and I shall be saved, what it reminds us is that the real battle of life are not the things that we think they are, that we're continually contending with in this world. But the real battle is, can I stay in a contemplative gaze, a prayerful presence with God? Which is what gives us the greatest virtue that we need to get through this world, which is hope. This reminded me of an ancient Greek tale called Orpheus and Eurydice. Have you guys ever heard of that? I think you'll recognize it once I start telling it. It's believed that it's been, it kind of originated around 530 BC. It's one of the oldest stories passed down, and it was retold by Virgil, by Ovid, by Plato, and it still finds its way expressed in musicals and plays and movies and books in our times. So what that says, though, is that there's something in this story, as simple as it might sound, that touches very deep into the human experience and can tell us about ourselves. If that were not the case, it wouldn't be rehashed over and over again. So according to legend, um, Apollo gave Orpheus a lyre and he taught him how to play music. And he was so good at it that nothing could resist his melodies, neither beasts uh, nor um, enemies and women. And Orpheus, one day, he fell in love with Eurydice, a beautiful, graceful woman, and they just fell passionately in love with one another. They got married. Well, then when the priest came to marry them, he predicted that their perfection was not meant to last. And it was just shortly after their marriage day, uh, Eurydice was out walking in the forest and a man came and tried to seduce her. And so she started running away from him. And as she was running, she wasn't watching her feet. So she stepped on a snake that bit her. It says her screams just carried all throughout the forest, even to um, Orpheus hearing it and running to her. Yet he only arrived just moments before she died. So all, after that, all of his songs and, and his melodies became a sad lament, a crying for the lost love that he had endured. And it was so moving even to the gods that they came to Orpheus and said, we will give you one chance to go down into the underworld and save Eurydice and bring her back, but only one. And so he goes and he travels into the underworld and he goes all the way down to Hades and Persephone, who are the, like the, the god and goddess of the underworld, and he plays his melodies even for them and shares the tale of his love for Eurydice. And they too were so moved by his devotion for his wife that they said, well, you can, uh, you can take her back. You can walk back up into the mortal realm, but with one condition. You must walk ahead of her, and you cannot look back until you've made it into the mortal realm. Easy enough. But it was a long journey. And a lot of the time it was just in a darkness. And all he could see was this very small glimmer of light in, in the distance that he had to keep walking towards day by day, never hearing his wife, never feeling his wife. And as he was walking, a lot of doubts began to come up in him of if she was even there. He'd call her name and she wouldn't respond. He'd try to reach behind her. He couldn't feel her. 
And so at one point, um, I actually want to read what Ovid himself wrote about that. Um, Overcome with doubts and fears and love and just this not knowing, at the very last moment, he did the only thing that he was forbidden to do. It says, Nor were they far from the edge of the top of the earth. Here, fearing that she was weakening and greedy to see, or out of love, a sudden mad desire surprised and seized For at the very threshold of the day, heedless, alas, and vanquished of resolve, he stopped, turned, looked upon Eurydice, his own beloved once more. But even with the look, poured out was all his labor, broken the bond of that fell tyrant. Immediately she slipped back into the underworld, and a crash was heard. The end. Well, actually, no, it goes on from there. He, uh, he gets so sad, he gets mauled by bears and dies. So it has a happy ending in the end, actually. So maybe he's uh, reunited with her, but forever separated now on earth. So the question that they always ask is, why did he look back? Why would anybody look back in this scenario? And there's many different ideas that have been pondered over the time. Um, some have said, if you see, like, there's really beautiful images and sculptures in Greece and Italy, even to this day, that it, that moment is replayed. And one of them is uh, Eurydice, like, grabbing at him, like, trying to get his face to look at her because she wasn't told what he was told. So she didn't know if he was even there, if he was real, if she was following a phantom, or if he had fallen out of love with her. And so she was trying so hard to get his attention to look at her, and at the last moment, he failed and looked and lost her. Another one that it's, it's just out of love, that he couldn't endure not to look back. You know, somebody say, why did you look, but why wouldn't you look? The same stories are uh, reflected in Lot's wife. When Lot and his wife are leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, they have one command, they cannot look back as the city is being consumed in flames. And, but you have to remember, Lot and his wife were there their entire lives, all of their family, all of their friends, all of their memories right behind them. Who wouldn't look back out of love? Anyone who's ever lost a loved one in their life knows how hard it is to not look back, even if it can destroy your present moment. Some say it was out of disobedience, that the very prohibition of something makes it that much more desirable. You just think about the forbidden fruit. The second you're told not to do something, all of a sudden it sounds pretty interesting. Right? But fundamentally, I think it comes down to a lack of trust. Right? The more we love anything in this life, the more we want to control it, to make sure that it's always with us. And sometimes, by the very act of trying to control what you love, you bring about its separation. That's in that um, terrible movie series back in the day, Star Wars. Right? Anakin, that's one movie I refuse to watch even to this day. I'll just watch Dune again. It's the same thing, basically. Um, all Star, Star Wars fans hate me right now. But I don't even know the name of her. What's her name? It's Anakin, and what's the woman's name? Yeah, you guys are all losers. Okay, so that, <laughs> that name. Um, but what's fascinating about her, this is what's so cool about this story, is he's given a lie, a fear that if he doesn't break the rules and go after her, that he's going to lose her. But it's in the very act of disobeying and trying to go to the dark side to save his love with her that he actually loses it. It all came out of distrust. And that's why the saints say that the greatest temptation that the devil plays on us in life is distrust. That God is not looking at us. That God does not know us. He doesn't see our problems. He doesn't see what we're going through. Therefore, we have to take control of it here and now. If Orpheus, and this is where I think that the reason I love this story so much is like we are Orpheus and this life is a passage through the underworld. And what we most love in this world is our Euclid. What is her name again? That, yes. It's the same thing with Star Wars. Okay, well, um, Eurydice. That's always a hard one. What we most love in this world is our Eurydice. It's what follows behind us. It's what trails us. It's what we most want to possess here and now. And the temptation as we're going through life 
is to stop looking at heaven, to stop gazing upon Christ, to stop entering into prayer. And when we do that, instead of all of our longings going towards heaven, we turn and we try to grasp that which is most meaningful to us. And then we end up losing it and sacrificing it because we want it to, sacrif- to satisfy everything in us. And I mean, the easiest place you can talk about this with is relationships. I think because we're made for the beatific vision. We're made for love. So there should be nothing in our life more important than love. Right? But if you've ever noticed, sometimes like the more you have to have, have, to have conversations about, of why a relationship isn't going well, in the very effort to preserve that relationship, you can actually drive it apart. The same things with children. The more you try to control children and give them everything you know to keep them on the right track, you can actually push them away. But if you end up praying together, if you're both looking in the same direction together, moving towards the light, how much more efficacious would that be? I see the same, the same thing happens. It's a tragedy, but I see it happen in the church, especially in our times. People who love the Catholic Church the most, who become most obsessed with either liturgy or its teachings or its dogmas, I've seen so many people lose their faith because they go so deep into the church that they stop thinking about Christ. And studying all the drama and the liturgy wars actually distracts them from an intimate prayer life of contemplation with God. Same thing can happen with our sins. If our sins that we struggle with in life are more important to us, are consuming our mind more than Jesus Christ, more than prayer, more than intimacy with Him, then it will drag us into the underworld. There should be nothing in our life that more fills our minds and our hearts than the thoughts of heaven and the contemplation of God in our prayer. And whatever is replacing that, and for every one of us is something unique, whatever's taking the place of that, that's where I need to focus. That's what's distracting me. And that's exactly what I need to bring to God in prayer. Our attention will always go where our eyes turn. That's a fundamental lesson of Orpheus. You know, St. Augustine, he had this commentary on the Psalms of this, of this exact passage. He says, Turn us again, O Lord of hosts. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we shall be saved. What does this mean? For wherever the soul of man turns itself, unless it is towards thee, it is enmeshed in sorrows. Even though it is surrounded by beautiful things, let my soul praise thee in all these things. But let not my soul be stuck to these things by the glue of love through the senses of the body. For they go where they were meant to go, that they may exist no longer. And they rend the soul with pestilent desires because she longs to rest secure in these very things that she loves. And yet, she, and yet there is no resting place to be found in them. All passes away, all moves on, and you alone remain. Wherever we most gaze upon, wherever we give our heart, that's where our attention goes, that's where our energy goes, that's where our our emotions go. And if it's not firmly fixed in heaven, in Christ, in the vision of His glory, then everything I feel at every moment will be dependent upon these things in the world. And I will be dispersed. That's why it's an invitation. Every single one of us to be Catholic does not mean to follow a moral code. Doesn't just mean to even go to Mass every Sunday. That's the beginning. To be a Catholic means to be a mystic and raptured in prayer. To know the face of God in intimacy and look at Him over and over again. And I'm telling you now, there is no greater protection from sin, from vice, and from disordered desire than contemplating the face of God. Every single day, 15 minutes a day of silent prayer. I have a good story to represent this. We once had a pit bull. Pit bull, his name was Lupe. My brother Dave, beautiful one in green in the front, he was, riding, uh, he was driving in Phoenix one day and he saw this pit bull that was uh, tied to a bike rack. 
for like three days straight. Every day, why it took him three days to finally stop and say something, I don't know. You can ask him after mass. But finally, he went up to it, and this was a kind of aggressive dog. And uh, so he took it, he brought it home, started feeding it, taking care of it. Then he brought it to our house. It was the most like beautiful, affectionate, loving pit bull you'd ever know for like 80% of the time. It was the 20% you had to be really careful of. But beyond that, it was really nice. But every once in a while, this pit bull, if the wind caught him right, he'd grab onto your leg, you know, and start, he'd forget that you were attached to your leg and he would, uh, as they say, go to town. And um, <laughs> when you, Father Nathan, how do you go from quoting Greek epics, St. Augustine to a dog humping a leg? I don't know. It's a gift, all right? So, but no matter what you did with this dog, it would bury its head into your leg and just hold on to you. And every time you tried to move it and push it away, it'd start growling and getting angry. There's only one thing that you could do to get this dog to let go of you. You had to put your hand underneath its neck and lift up its eyes to look at your eyes. It was a really awkward moment for both of us. <laughs> and it could not stand the awkwardness of that. It's like a, he realizes that you're a human being. And all of a sudden, he just let go and walked away every single time. That's a deep story, isn't it, right? There's, you try, instead of, you know, we, we come, sometimes become so obsessed with like, I need to not sin. I need to not look at pornography. I need to not love the world so much. And when we have that kind of conception, we can actually become the opposite effect where we hold on to it even more because it's all we're looking at. But if we lift up our gaze to heaven, if we have images of Christ that we just contemplate, enter into that prayerful intimacy with God, there's no greater power to let go of the world than that. That is the power of prayer, and that's our greatest power as Catholics. And that is our great secret to perseverance through the underworld. And this, the greatest thing about that is when we truly seek God above everything else and His image, what we most love in this world, like Eurydice, will be following right behind us on the way to heaven because it's properly ordered. Lord, let Your face shine upon me and I shall be saved. If the face of Christ is the most important image that I have in my heart and in this life. Not only will I be saved, but everything that I most love in this world will follow right after. 